Welcome to the creative community. I'm your host, David Starkey, and my guest this time is poet and photographer, Holiday Mason. Holiday, welcome. Thank you. Can't wait to talk with you. What fun, right? <laughs> yeah, okay. it's, this is going to be one of the best shows. <laughs> we don't know that. <laughs> we, 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 you know, I have a we're feeling. just coming into the kitchen with yeah, our that's right. stuff. We got our stuff. We're going to talk a, um, a good bit about your poetry. We're mm. also going to talk about your kind of parallel a little bit intersecting career as a photographer, mm -hmm, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and then if we have a little time, we'll talk about the work that you do as a psychotherapist, which also you mm -hmm. know, is all connected with creativity. Yeah. Um, but um, <clears throat> I know that if people are like, oh, holidays on the show, they want to hear your poetry. Uh -huh. So um, I'd love to just start off the program with, with a poem. Great. Um, and I think Great. you've got something from your book, Towards the Forest? I have something from Towards the Forest. New Rivers Press, and it's a poem I often like to start with because um, I I know it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Seven pairs of swans. I sense the profiles of my husband and mother beside me at the water's edge, staring intently through the smoky twilight as seven trumpeter swans glide in perfect formation toward the inlet where they'll weather the night. No one speaks, and our breath is gentle, and the dog even stays on his haunches, head thrusting forward as the birds merge into a white ship on a surface of steel until, reflected clearly on the water, are seven pairs of stately twins giving the impression of spirits whose black beaks and faces disappear into the growing darkness as if parts of them go ahead into death, so they're neither in this world nor the next, but both, and the fact they simply sail across the pillars of fire, light, falling from the windows of cabins along the shore does little to dispel this feeling so much so that my mother rests her hand across my husband's back just as he reaches for my wrist where I, a little apart, watch as two, four, then all seven of the silent winter swans slip beyond the thick wall of cedar trees, reeds, and blue tail grass until the last of them has vanished. The swans mate for life. Do they? Uh, they do. Wow. Um, How nice. That is a, <laughs> I, w I thought of that because it's a poem that seems to, to find a kind of eternity in this transient moment you know mm -hmm. I mean the speaker is is seeing these things but of course the, the swans are gone mm -hmm. in the end mm -hmm. um, what about uh, tell me the composition of that poem how did, how did that come together wow such a question I I don't have any idea you don't remember I tend to write or I have um, it's changing a little now after what's 30 mm. 35 40 years of writing but a lot of these poems they just they just come in mm -hmm. I hear the poem and you find a place to write it down I write it down usually immediately uh -huh. it, you know if you don't do that like I was just driving here and um, there's something I need to write and I had an entry into it it's more of an essay mm -hmm. and I didn't write it down <laughs> it's gone. <laughs> it's gone. Yeah. So, you know, and then, you know, a lot of the writing is, the, there's that first experience mm -hmm. that forms into words, sort of like um, the, the experience is like the body, the actual physical body of the swans, 
and then how it comes through through our bodies or my body as a poet into language is like the reflection of the swans I in the water mm -hmm. so you're straddling two realms also right much right. like the swans and sure. the reflection yeah. and those yes are they're wedded in a way so right. you're 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 marrying the mm, ephemeral with the actual right and, and the eternal in right and too. it comes in through language and then of course Writing is rewriting. You have it, and then you work the poem. Right. So when you say you, you want to grab the poem, was mm -hmm. that something that you grabbed right afterwards, or was it something that you recollected a while later? Honestly, I, I, don't, I don't remember, because it's a pretty, pretty old poem. Yeah, yeah. It, it's a, this book has been, I don't remember, but it's, it's not a young poem. Right, right. Um, but if I don't write it down right away... It's gone. Yeah. So yeah. I must have written it down. Yeah. Right and, and do you yeah. write, you say, you know, redrafting and revision is, is so important, but do you write out a full draft um, before, do you like, like, this is the poem, I'll get back to it, or do you write it in, in chunks? I don't I mean, in, in general. Well, I, I think those things are both chunks. Yeah. So the way uh, that I tend to write is I, I almost always write cursively. Okay. There's something about the kinesthetic connection between what I'm talking about, this mm -hmm. sort of downloading of uh, our personal mythology and the numinous and all of those things in through the body and I write by hand and often it's a huge mess like a giant mess mm -hmm. and then I will enter it into the computer and then work with it from there mm -hmm. I don't tend to do one poem if this is your question in pieces yeah. the poem comes and then I work then with the work poem yeah, right. but I don't have like a concept in my mind for a poem or I haven't yeah. I don't I haven't had that experience well, I, I ask because when I'm writing a poem <coughs> I often feel like if I don't finish it even if it has a lousy ending right that it's it's dead I somehow didn't deliver it all the way through okay uh, that's kind of what I okay was, uh, that's that's harsh <laughs> <laughs> I got a lot of dead poems. <laughs> yeah, that's hard, do you uh, know? Yeah. Uh, so no, I would feel like the body of the poem or the, the, the mass of the poem is there. Okay. And then work then with the poem. Like, yeah. So if the ending isn't right, you know, uh, there's scaffolding. I have written poems, which I don't have it on our list, but I have it here. It's a tiny poem and it originated as a very long narrative poem mm -hmm. and I just cut it out you know so yeah to get to the essence yeah to get to that poem yeah. I, I couldn't even tell you what the, the original poem right. was well I can I ask you about going back you said you've been doing this for quite a number of years mm -hmm. do you recall the moment or moments when you thought uh, this is something that I want to do or that I have to do that I'm somehow compelled to no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was just a gradual I, I thing. just, the, you know, I started writing poems when I was five years old. Okay, so that's looking it. out the window, right. my iris comes in yellow, just like a falling star. Yeah. Ooh, <laughs> that's that's good. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, and so I, you know, I don't know. We all have different relationships with our art. Art is difficult, and sometimes I. Um, I can't say I hate it. It is a precious gift, mm -hmm. but it's hard. And sometimes I don't know what to do with it, or why are we doing with it? But uh, what, why, you know? But it, it, it is something one is needs to do. Mm -hmm. It's a needed thing. Mm -hmm. For you? For, for me? For me? I, I, it is for me. Right. I have to assume it is for you. But I'm, no, I'm thinking of me now as your reader. Um, that's more complex in that the world has changed in terms of people's ability and um, to connect to certain things. And I think that has everything to do with the internet. Mm -hmm. And uh, Well, and people are most likely watching this on the internet if they're not watching yeah, it on Yeah, there's TV. beautiful things about the internet. I mean, everything has its light and shadow, but I think you have to. Poetry is such an oral art, mm -hmm. you know, it really is. And I don't think very many people 
know that. Visual arts are easier. Like the photographs are, whether you comprehend them or like them, they're, they're, up, they're yeah, easier yeah, to yeah, enter, sure, right? Yeah. A poem has to be heard and so. And there's a way of listening for poems that I think is an acquired Yeah, I, I agree. And skills. particularly any poems that are elliptical mm -hmm. or um, what <laughs> I've once heard called difficult, like Jory Graham, mm -hmm. difficult. But if you are struggling to enter how the poem is embodying things and I, I, it's magnificent. So I think, I think they're absolutely necessary. I think it's as necessary as many, many things like the natural world and that. Okay. Did uh, you get my little burp there? Let's go to the yeah. Weaver's Body because I, you know, this is your your latest book, and yes. I, I want you to to promote it a little bit here yeah. on the creative yeah, community. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So. Um, I'm going to read a poem from The Weaver's Body. You know, just because something is a recent book doesn't mean all the poems are brand new. Oh, so collections yeah. come together, I I like houses, you know, like that works with that collection, that works right. with And then there's a through line. But this poem is called Cantilever. In the morning, it's two hours getting beyond pain as certain as damp weather. Finally, Walking your oblivious dog around the corner, you follow a caravan of clouds traveling slowly across the gold towers of Century City. A man throws a beer can from a car. A yellow finch lands on a stoplight. It returns to green. You linger in what it is to be lost and listening to that freedom sense the weight of even the grass growing. The city is hard and stupid with hardness, the young backfiring of streets after midnight. It interests you, the facelessness, how we all become similarly mystical when dying. This storm will be warm and swollen with jasmine. This rain will swell lace through the purple trees. You already put your winter wools away. Remember, a distant friend's child has died before her, and she's an old woman. The sign over an ancient door translates into something about a tailor and a cook. The unlit street lamps whisper, you would have held her close if she'd have let you. Mm. You know, you're such a rhythmic reader, and um, yeah. the, that's obviously a central element of your poetry. Yeah. Also, sounds, you yeah. know, I, I sometimes I don't know if you when you're, if you're listening to poets reading in another language that you can you can hear the music even if you have no earthly idea yeah. what's being said, yeah. um, and I could certainly feel that. But that those are just partly uh, partial elements of that poem because it, it's such a moving poem and it has that little um, twist at the end there. That, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. um, so you know I, I'm coming back to the same question about what what is a poem supposed to do? Um, what what does it, what does it do for people? Hmm. Take take three on that qu on that same have question. Have you tried twice already <laughs> in this conversation? Maybe I Maybe am. somebody else. <laughs> no, no. I, I feel like I'm, I feel like I'm asking that same question, just coming from different okay, vantages. Okay, so okay, but you're asking me again. What is it supposed to do? What does it? Or do? does it? How does it? Okay. Maybe um, both. You know, I don't know if I've ever thought about it. I think, like. Any, I, I think this is really germane, and I was just speaking to someone about this, um, specifically to literature mm -hmm. and written work. Um, it, it allows a communication of some human uh, depth and experiences that, that connect human to human and allow the listener or reader to grow. Okay. 
internally grow because they can take it on and consider that you know in I guess I want to use the word empathically consider mm -hmm. it for but within the context of their own capacities okay does that make yeah it does and, and I think one of the reasons why I'm, I'm so preoccupied with Right. pushing you on this is right, because right, I know right, you've right. thought about it so much, not just as a poet, but also as a photographer and as, right. as a therapist. Right. Um, they're all connected. Well, some things like music, I, I don't think it functions quite in the same way. It's, a, it's slightly more subjective, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Um, can we get another poem? Because we, we have about just 12 yeah. minutes left, oh believe it or not. And yeah, I, well, I want to look at your photographs. OK, too. OK. <laughs> Again, it, it turns out I'm reading some pretty older poems okay. from this. And I think we can, just for the interest of time, we'll skip this. And okay. then I'll go into a brand new okay. piece. OK, that sounds good. But this poem is called Concerning Various Birds. The photo was taken after my mother began to grow deaf. She is ahead of me on the trail through the dinosaur ferns at Orcas Lake. We had just quarreled over what I don't know, the subject forgotten but not the fact. We must have hurt each other badly enough to want to part. Watching her between the slim white elbows of sun-blanched pine, hands clasped behind her back, chin tilted straight as the prow of a little ship prowling through waves of gravity in her robes of silence, tiny body disappearing into the framework of the old forest she left me. And this was as credible to me as any kind of love. The ochre farms of winter Wisconsin still have my mother's heart, even from the distance of a lifetime. Watching her, I wondered if she ever recalled the creak of her father's footfall at night, the curdle of red wine. As I imagined it, there were accidents of sorts, then bathwater running. No one talked about it in the morning, but what never gets said can still be heard. Perhaps she needed her dreams of quiet. Snow is quiet. I remember the birds were loud that day. Crows, red-sided towhees, blue jays. She couldn't hear them, or my camera is snapping right after I'd run hard to catch her. She was mad. She walked fast. And thinking herself in a private world, she was farting like a train of quacking ducklings. I caught her arm and turned her to face me and shouted out one word, ducks. Recognition is like a satellite circling two worlds, she and I. And when our mouths open wide, we laughed all the birds right out of the sky. Mm. There's a line in there that it keeps resonate with me. What can't be heard, mm -hmm. never be said, can still be heard. What never, yeah. what what doesn't get said, can still, still be heard. heard. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of a ars poetica right. in a way. Yeah. Um, let's <laughs> let's go to the to the the, sure. the next poem, Carnival, because okay. I want to I want to make that. sure that we have time for, right. for okay. photos. Um, I've been working on a series of poems which you know they, they don't come as concepts but they just started to come and they have to do with my girlhood they seem they're very much surrounding um, the struggle of prepubescence into adolescence and sexuality for girls mm -hmm. you know and again the body always you know so it's called carnival so the woods on that Midwestern island. So the river on my left as I travel with my shadow. So the crisscross vocabulary of leaf and shade across the bracken path. Then the memory of a teenage pop song and my high soprano singing. There, 
the scent of skin, mine, theirs, the trees, there, a smell of new blood, damp leaf musk under mats of clouds, and the river edge stagnant in pools slow as milky coffee, and it's just before dead noon in the woods beyond the town, and tomorrow or the next day the carnival would come. Twelve years old is nothing, and yet it's everything, brand new, and the incense of the water, the sudden burst of my first blood, ribbons down my thighs in the woods just before noon or now just slightly after, then the low squatting down, both hands filling with blood and draining into mulch with the slow river's music the flush of morning doves through the ceiling of the trees, and tomorrow after dusk the carnival would come straddling the low river near the cornfields while in town my grandmother would stand upright still drinking her red wine. So I must have smelled of hunger rising and I must have made them very eager. Three tall boys with one rotten fish. They were swinging, hitting trees near the muddy river banks the day before the carnival arrived to set up all its glitter, Ferris wheel, eerie sideshows, cotton candy and tiny rows like ballerinas. Orange sawdust settled in a pond within the wide sea of corn I would later drive through in an old Mercedes with the top down, all alone and singing. So on the day of first blood, I was wandering the woods and hidden things came real, an enormous rotten fish slapping around my face and three large angry boys before the carnival. I bled alone in the woods when a trout fat with gore struck my cheeks, my hair, and mouth, painting me a cape of scales, of fear, the large dead fish now, my hallowed crown, my rainbow shawl of wrought, veil of womanhood. So I was 12 years old in the Wisconsin woodlands singing. So I was a dense shadow of perfume. So I was a sudden burst of everything red. So I was a girl alone, the mother, lover, ghost in a gifted gown of fish, fish gems, skin in my mouth, fish to the north, all day, all night, just before the carnival, would rise up in the blue slanting cornfields. I'd one day drive through in an old car alone, alone, and singing. Mm. Well, I love how the imagery gets repeated <laughs> with the difference uh, over and over again. Uh, mm -hmm. And there's a sense of both beauty and brutality, which gives mm -hmm. me a great seg to our photographs. <laughs> so let's see if we can call them up from the studio, mm -hmm. and we're going to have you talk us through seven images that you've taken. Um, I'm just going to let you take the lead on this holiday. Tell me what we're looking at and why it's important. You know, uh, why is it important? Oh, that, no, that's, well, that's important a monolith yeah, that's of, <laughs> of, of, of uh, ego. I, I don't have any idea. Uh, it's beautiful. It is. Uh, and I, it, it, it's a little disturbing, so to me that's always interesting. Okay. Um, a lot of the poems have everything to do with uh, deconstructing um, our identity with our relationship of the raw and the natural mm -hmm. to, um, mm, how can we say, the manicured and okay. uh, the, the prescriptions of uh, how we are supposed to look mm -hmm. uh, and how embedded in all of those facades, including my struggle with the monitor to make sure <laughs> I look good, right? Um, there's always um, death, mm -hmm. sex, and those things are in all the natural world. So they have everything to do with that. 
the images. Let's take a look at the next image. Well, this one's a little more obvious, right? Um, I've been using different colored veils. I use a lot. I work with a lot of nudes, uh, um, a lot of people uh, that are elders, mm -hmm. um, to again respect that. So this is a figure in a, a, a blood red veil going down. Down somewhere to a closed door. To a closed yeah. dark door. You don't know where. Yeah. Yeah. Let's take a look at the next one. I love the ghostly image of you on top of that. I, and I, just, yeah. I love this image. So uh, my model was taking the male model's hair and lifting it uh -huh. and letting it go. But in the shot, because I was shooting f fast, um, she just has her hands up. So, you know, you... <laughs> you <laughs> she looks like a cobra or something like right, that. Right, but there's a red feminine, obviously feminine being, uh -huh. right? Right. Um, so and there's a lot of embedded metaphor, as there are in the poems. Yeah. It, it, the, you know, like the carnival is sex. It's right. falling well, in love. Well, and that splash of color that uh, we've uh, seen in all three yeah, of these. Yeah, 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 yeah. And this is a little more classic, uh, but... Yeah, I mean, you know, as, as you're taking photographs, or is there someone in particular or some photographers in general that you're thinking about? I think ah, about? Yeah. Uh-uh. No? You just take, yeah. a, take the picture? Well, you know, we love who we love, you both know. as poets and, yeah. and photographers. You know, I yeah. can name... Many people. Well, it looks like a, it looks like a, a Manet painting to me. <laughs> but that, that's much more like a painting. And yeah. I think of often the poems and the photographs as paintings. They're, these are very surreal. I mean, the, to me, if I even aspired to touch a, 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 an organization of the image, like Cadelco, do you see how the shadows uh -huh. are moving right. in a line all the way down? Right. And um, the model, I I think she has an apple on her forehead. Okay. So then we have William Tell, we have the Garden of Eden. Mm -hmm. They're extremely archetypal. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people just go, what is that? <laughs> but uh, to me, they make sense. Again, um, uh, from the Red Veil right, series, right. there's a lot of these images in different contexts. Uh, just so happens, um, the male model grew up in a place just like this okay. so it had all of these echoes and the croquet and you know what's underneath the facade of the quotidian and the mundane mm -hmm. this is a concern for me yeah, I, with it, everything with your poetry absolutely yeah. Yeah. yeah so you know this there's the there's what's happening on the surface and then there's all this wow just like with psychotherapy right what's mm -hmm. happening this is our final one and we're sure. getting down to our last yeah, yeah. minute here yeah so beautiful. You know, I like to use places that are available to me, and I just knocked down a garage, and so, uh, and I love the deconstructionism of bringing the, the, the light in, mm -hmm. which I think is hilarious, but it's not a funny picture. It's a disturbing picture. That's going to have to be the note that we end our interview on. <laughs> Too I bad. Knew, yeah, I, I knew we were going to have so much to talk okay. about. We'll do it next time. Okay, we'll part do it two. again. Sure. Holiday, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you so much for doing this show. Uh, what, a, what fun yeah. and what, um, what a gift that I, you give. I, I, this has been a great gift for me. Great. Thank you. The Creative Community is produced in Ventura by Phil Taggart and his fantastic crew. I'm your host, David Starkey, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.